Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Society of Geneva. We are a church <clears throat> that is part of a living tradition. That means a variety of things. It means that we are a tr uh, church that are, that are bound by a tradition of curiosity, an affirmation of the great spiritual quest for truth and meaning, and by promises that we make to one another about the spiritual values that we uphold. It also means we have no creed, <clears throat> no tests of faith. And that means that your questions and your doubts are welcome here. Wherever you are on your journey, we invite you to be part of this congregation in which we draw wisdom from all the world's religions, balanced with the insights of modern science. Here we seek to build a diverse, beloved community, and it is our great hope to inspire each other, challenge each other, and accompany each other as together we act for hope, peace, love, and justice in our lives and in our larger world. It was dark. The bonfire was throwing sparks some 30 feet into the warm spring air. Around the fire, dozens of figures swayed and chanted, dancing with the shadows as if the shadows were living things. At some point, the drums settled into a thrumming beat on my skin and in my feet. The sound swelled and faded and swelled again. Someone was running. There was a great cheer and a painted figure leapt over the fire. A beat, and then there was another. Another beat, and there went a third. The fire was hungry and urgent, and the cheering was like a drum, and then it was my turn. I ran, I leapt. And I came down into the arms of my friends, all of us laughing with delight and relief. And the warm breath of spring kissed the fear from our faces and our hot skins. We went around again and again and again until the sun finally woke us and sent us with our ribbons and our drums That was my first Beltane. Sometime before I'd answered an ad, a local group had advertised an introductory class in witchcraft <clears throat> and paganism. And for reasons that escaped me both then and now, I went. Hard to describe how impulsive this was for me. I knew no one who was into this. I had read no books, and I wasn't even sure that the library would have such books. I had heard no NPR interviews, seen nothing on the news or TV or anything. 35 years ago, the internet was not a thing. The X-Files was not a thing. There were no things. This was the dark ages. <laughs> for all I knew, I was signing up for some kind of retro sex cult thing. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with retro sex cults, if that's your thing. I'm just saying that college-aged me may have had a few weird ideas about what I was about to get into. So there I was at my first orientation meeting. And yes, pagans apparently do have orientation meetings. Thankfully, this was before PowerPoint. And the meeting people, yeah, okay, fine. <clears throat> but I had a mimeographed sheet, uh, and it laid things out relatively clearly. There was then a presentation, some stories that were shared, and there was time for Q and A. I just listened through most of this. I'm pretty sure I was pie-eyed the entire time. And I'll be honest, I didn't get it. I didn't get the language, I didn't get the process, I didn't get the point of pagan worship. It was alien and I was set apart. But I did learn very quickly that at least this particular pagan group was not a retro sex cult. And I also learned that some of the other orientation attendees were 
very disappointed by this revelation. I was later told that these individuals were not invited back, but I was. And I was one of eight newbies. I was the only male in my group. I was also the youngest in that group. The others ranged in age from mid twenties to early seventies. Our leader was to be an older woman and by older, I mean, Her name was Selene, after the goddess of the moon. She was my mother, my friend, my role model, and my teacher. And over the next few years, I learned an astonishing number of things. Most of them are secret. But what I can share is this. For a tall, tanned, thin, and astonishingly good looking, come on, these are the jokes, people. <clears throat> I cannot imagine a more humbling experience than being adopted by eight older women. These women took my arrogance, my ignorance, my foolishness, my puritanical and patriarchal American attitudes about gender and sex and sanded them off of me as if I were driftwood. I loved them. Together we were family and together we made magic. This would be a good time to do our thing. I'm going to ask the tech team to bring our uh, remote guests back into the sanctuary. Uh, and if that is you and you haven't activated your camera, it's a good time to do that. <clears throat> now, all together and in the spirit of our friend, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III of Trinity Church here in Chicago, I want you now to turn to a neighbor. Any neighbor will do. Just pick somebody randomly in the audience online or in person, turn to that person and say, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor, this is Beltane. This is Beltane. <laughs> Excellent, well done, amen. Paganism is an old word. It's also a bad word in that it referred primarily to anyone not living in the city. It was those poor and unwashed that were as yet not converted to Christianity. That's how the word. Now, today, neo-paganism can mean a lot of things, but it tends to refer to the practices springing up from myths and traditions and history of Northern and Western Europe. Neo-pagan, neo for new, it's an act of reclamation, an intentional, in some cases, an intentional rejection of Christianity and modern Christian culture in favor of wisdom that may have been left behind. Two more terms, witchcraft and Wicca. <clears throat> These used to be interchangeable, but I understand now that they mean different things. Anyway, I'm going to put that aside just for a moment and say these words describe a set of beliefs and practices, namely that there are powers that can and do act here on earth, that regular people can interact with those powers and ask them to intervene on our behalf, that rituals and prayers can and do create change in the world around us, and those are the basics. I think what most of us think of by witchcraft, though, is the practice of magic. Well, not as flashy as Wanda Maximoff or Doctor Strange in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which would be awesome, or even the more subtle magic of the Lord of the Rings novels. Nevertheless, practitioners believe that they have esoteric power or access to it, and that they can exercise that power through the use of spells. And that sounds odd to our cultured ears, doesn't it? Sounds odd. It's almost, it almost sounds like Catholic priests performing sacraments or followers of, the, followers of the prosperity gospel manifesting wealth in their lives. And I'm a bad person for even saying any of that out loud. <laughs> Forgive my snark. The point is there are lots of traditions in the world that believe in the power of what some might call magic. 
<clears throat> some maybe, and I'll confess right now that that wasn't me. If you've taken one of my classes, you'll probably have heard me talk about the difference between Roman religion, at least as practiced around the time of Jesus of Nazareth, and the religion of Christianity as practiced several centuries after the death of Jesus of Nazareth. For those of you who have not had that pleasure yet, it's a matter of time, right? Uh, here's the short form. With Christianity, what you believe matters very much. Orthodoxy from orthos, meaning straight or true, and doxa, meaning belief or doctrine. Orthodoxy mattered because orthodoxy is the only way you get rewarded in the Christian tradition. Now, this is in contrast with the ancient Roman religion because there, rewards came from behavior, not belief. When bad things happened, people could only assume that the gods were angry. Why were, there, why were they angry? Well, they were angry because we did not do things. We did honor them, we did honor to them through our orthopraxy, our straight and true and correct actions. The practice of ritual magic to my mind is like this, a kind of orthopraxy. Rituals are performed to create change in the world. Yes, sure. But primarily we offer them as a way to honor the earth and the seasons, the interdependent web of all existence, the inherent worth and dignity of human beings and the unending cycle of life here on earth. And viewed this way, Wicca, the tradition of my young adulthood, is not that different from either Unitarian Universalism or the religion of Imperial Rome. Now, where the differences become a bit clearer is the DIY nature, the do-it-yourself part of modern paganism and witchcraft. Now, saying that, I also have to acknowledge that many practitioners believe that their practices are really, really old. Some say they are thousands of years old, handed down mother to daughter, teacher to student for countless generations. And that this fact is precisely why those traditions had meaning and value. Age, profound age makes profound meaning. However, as a religious practitioner in a faith tradition that is only about 60 years old, I will offer this observation. Age doesn't always line up with truth. Unitarian Universalism teaches that we shouldn't keep doing something one way simply because we've always done it that way. Novelty and change are spiritual virtues and can often be found in the company learning and growth. And together, these virtues can make some pretty interesting things, things like meaning. So I have a story for this. My kids were into Legos. I wonder if they're even gonna pay attention when I say this. They're in the back of the room right now, probably ignoring me. That's fine. Now, they were really into Legos. Anybody here have kids into Legos? Anybody into Legos? Legos are fun, right? Just a little painful for the feet, but they're still really good. Now, we'd get kits and we'd build them and we'd play with them. Sometimes these kits would break apart during, the play, uh, during our play and sometimes they'd break completely apart. And sometimes my kids wouldn't put them back together. I used to get mad. As any parent will tell you, Lego kits are really expensive. Why should I get them if they're just gonna break them up? I forget what kid it was. It was expensive. Maybe it was the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. I can't remember. This is something I'd always wanted as a kid, so I, I have no problem imagining that I got it for my kids, just me living through my kids, reliving my childhood. I'm sure that's totally alien to all of you. But I remember getting this thing in and we built it together and it may have held together for a few months. But at some point, it was gone. And I remember being bummed. But at some other point, a new falcon emerged from the mess. 
It was like the old one, but some of the tiles were a different color or maybe a slightly different shape. It worked well, this new one, until one day this one also broke apart, and I'm pretty sure it died a valiant death. Now, my kids had assembled the original and loved it, and when it was done, they disassembled it. When they were ready again, they reassembled a new one out of the spare parts that they had lying around. Each time they played the heck out of what they had and when they were done, the parts went back in the bin. I think of neo-paganism this way. It doesn't matter if it's based on a practice unchanged for over a thousand years. It doesn't matter if it is brand new, but entirely, dry, ent entirely derived from practices that are assembled in whole or part from the bits of other religious traditions. The point isn't the age. The point is, does it serve? Neo-pagans of whatever stripe have found modern mainstream religion to be lacking. Lacking what? Well, I think the answer is it depends. Some are rebuffed by patriarchy. Some are turned away by the lack of inclusion. Some by hypocrisy, some by trauma. Some, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, because internal truths cannot be swallowed along with communion wine. They have to be experienced to have value. Lastly, there are, well, maybe lastly, there are some of us that just need to get our hands down into the dirt of things, to feel the mystery in our fingers. Because the act of constructing rituals is an act of constructing me. And if something doesn't work, if it doesn't serve, you get to change things. Hold to what works, cast off what does not. And that is Beltane. I'll close today's reflection with another story. When I was younger, I was not very friendly toward Christianity. I was very definitely not ready to pray with the evangelicals at the weekly Young Life meetings that I somehow found myself at. A long story. Now, I was pretty sure that accepting Jesus as my personal savior meant joining some kind of retro sex cult. And then we can talk about why I keep repeating that phrase over and over again. It's a fertility holiday, people. But the point is, I didn't get it. I didn't get the language. I didn't get the process. I didn't get the point of Christian worship. It was alien and I was set apart. I told you before that my father-in-law was an Episcopal priest. Yeah, did anybody remember that? True, he was an Episcopal priest. And I imagined that I was not the devout son-in-law that a good priest might have aspired to. And given our very different religious paths, quite possible that our relationship could have been very different. Now, I like to think that we were actually close because in part, I had all of these Legos in my bins. From my time as a UU kid, from my coursework in philosophy, and perhaps, perhaps, from the continuous theological construction project that was my life as a pig. Figuratively and literally, I had passed through the cleansing fire not once, but many, many I had been sanded down by caring people, and now I had the tools to build a bridge. Paganism gave me the And that may be, at least in part, why this man, this Christian priest, was also my father, my friend, my role model, and my teacher. Don't get me wrong, I'm an atheist and I'm still obnoxious. But what I learned from Celine and all the other women in my coven made it possible to learn from dad. Who here danced the maypole outside just a few minutes ago? A couple of you, I saw you, that was fun. If you've never danced a maypole or have no idea what a maypole is, 
It's a giant wooden rod jammed into the earth. And if the symbolism there is erotic, that is on purpose. Ritz Beltane is a fertility festival after all. Now, at the top of some of the maypoles that I've seen and used, we basically tie tons of flowers, right? And the, up there at the very tip, we uh, tie ribbons. And the brighter the ribbon, the better. Bright colors really are important. Now, when everybody's ready, you take your end of the ribbon, you all stretch out, and then you dance, sing, and go around the pole, weaving in and out, round and round and round. Eventually, we get to the end, and everyone slams into each other, and that's hilarious. And above us, we see that the ribbons have knitted together to a brilliant mosaic of color. My adult life is a maypole. I'm guessing that if you're here, yours is too. So many things, so many experiences brought us to now. Some of them good, those we hold on to. Some of them not good, those we consign to the flame. So today, pause a moment and imagine dancing your own maypole, or maybe go out and use the one we've got there in the, in the courtyard. Revel in the colors, revel in your colors. The markers of our true or spiritual or just aspirational life. But let us marvel at them, at each other, and the glory of life renewed and replenished, just as the world around us is renewed and replenished. And as we prepare to leave this place, continue your journey in love, care for one another, and care for this, our earth. Do justice and make peace. And as you go, know that whatever taste or touch you've had in this time and maybe virtual place of hope, joy, love, peace, fire, that goes with you out into the world. We are different for having spent this time together. So remember, right, exactly, live boldly and with thanksgiving. Go in peace. <laughs>